wait a trial, the closing statements of the prosecution, and, and unbeknownst to me, um, a mystery guest have come walking through the doors, one of my ride or dies, um, this is the guy, when I have an actual legal question that I'm confused about on the law and I need it well written, concise, on point, and, and, and can rely upon that to go to the public, Aaron Keller, our guest, unbeknownst to me, is here. This is concerning. If you're putting that much weight in my analysis, you have way more experience than I do. But apparently we work well together. Good yeah, to well, see you. it's great to see you, Aaron. And, you know, um, we were just sparking off with some conversations. And folks, like I said, feel free to put in any questions that you got. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the style of this prosecutor. I, I you know, listen, uh, reasonable minds can differ about things, Aaron. I really like this guy, and I'm going to tell you why. It's one thing to be throwing evidence out there, and, and sometimes there's a tendency with lawyers where they just want to blah, 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 get it all out and, and feel like they check the, the marks on a box. And then there's those lawyers, I like to say, uh, have that je ne sais quoi. They have this certain thing about them where they're just really good in front of them. They have rhetorical flourishes, rhetorical questions. They're really weaving that evidence into complex legal theories. And, and just little comments like, wow, you know, that he's making, or does that make sense to you? And then playing the statement and weaving in those complex capital murder offenses. What do you think about the style of this prosecutor? Well, look, this guy's having a conversation with the jury. He's not just checking off boxes on a form to make sure that he's got his indictment all buttoned up before he sends it off to the clerk. Okay, I agree with you. He's leading these jurors through a story. He's matching the facts up with the law, saying, look, this is what you heard on the witness stand. Let's listen to it again because I happen to have a clip of the important part. And here's how it plugs into the charge. He's guilty. Do you folks understand? And he's looking for what we can't see. The camera can't show the jury here, but he can see the jury. If he thinks a member of that jury is confused, he's going to go back over that again. Yeah. He's making his points very, very clearly. He's got a great case here. Yeah, listen, you, you, I think what you just said was really important. He's having a conversation with the jury rather than talking at the jury, which you see happen with even good trial lawyers, there's that tendency to kind of just like kind of belt it out there. But uh, he's, he's also got a good style in terms of slowing down his, his statements when he really wants them to listen to something. He's using all those communication techniques. He's, he's keeping the jury interested. And I agree with you completely. I've done it myself. You're looking at that jury. You're, and every now and again, you'll see kind of like a wince or a quizzical look. And I would, when I used to train trial practice, I'd say, you need to stop. Because that jury either didn't agree with what you just said, or that jury didn't understand what you said, or you probably didn't say it correctly, which is most times uh, the case. And even what I really like about this guy, too, is he keeps getting back to the central theme of his case, even though he's talking about different things, and that is the capital murder offenses. I, I just think he's really skilled. It's great to watch. Uh, so I agree with you completely. Now, let's get into some serious evidence talk here, because we know that the viewers love to talk evidence. And um, I like to use the analogy, Aaron, that the evidence rules, there's a book, and it has rules about what can be introduced into evidence and what can't be. People kind of think that you can just kind of throw it all out there and let the jury make a decision, and that's not the way it works. And we just discussed prior to you getting on that uh, typically in most places the rules are now numbered mm -hmm. accordingly. And evidence rule 403 deals with what's relevant evidence and what could be excluded because the prejudicial value outweighs the probative effect. And, and there's also a rule right after that, 404 in most jurisdictions, which is other crime evidence. And so that the audience understands, typically speaking, the crime is supposed to, or the trial is supposed to be about that particular crime and that particular set of circumstances, not all these extraneous other things that the person may or may not have done in their life. Yeah, threshold inquiry, my evidence professor used to say, uh, and, and he'll be pleased that I'm quoting him right now, <laughs> he used to say evidence rules ultimately are efficiency rules. They're designed to move the jury towards a decision as efficiently as possible. Right. It doesn't matter if somebody got caught running down the hallway in elementary Entry school as to whether or not they're guilty of an offense 20 years later. Also, as you said, we're trying each charge as its charge, not trying to just paint the defendant as a so-called bad character. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work either. That's that's not American justice. That That's just trying to say somebody's a bad character. Right. That's not the way it works either. It's about conduct. And the rules are designed to hone the jury in on the conduct as 
charge. So, so once we go through that, we can get into the next issue, which is why the tapes weren't played, correct? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I just to, to uh, go off your point there about the rules, um, you know, after a while when you've been doing this long enough, when you first start out as a young lawyer, some of the rules just don't seem to make sense to you. You know what they are, like hearsay, for example, and that's an out-of-court statement used to prove the truth of the matter asserted. And then there's about 30 exceptions to the hearsay rule, <laughs> except for in this instance, that instance, and the other instance. And what you really do get to see after a while is that, hey, some pretty wise folks prior to us kind of understood how to make this fair so that a trial isn't just by this guy said that this guy said that another guy said such and such, that you really have real evidence coming into the court. And, and this is why people like us sit here and we start to flip out when, uh, when we see cases uh, that uh, involve a lot of attempts to put character evidence or some other type of evidence in, we turn around and say, wait a minute, there's a confrontation clause. I don't care that this person heard it fourth hand. I want to see the person who heard it firsthand up on the stand. I want to look that person in the eye. I want to judge that person's demeanor. I want to see that person cross-examined as to conflicts of interest, mistaken perceptions, whether or not they were friends with somebody, whether they've got something to gain by it. I want to hear all that come out on the stand from the person who heard it firsthand. That's the whole point of confronting the witnesses against us. And like you said, sometimes trial watchers look at these rules and say, oh, gee, I really wish the jury could have heard about his other conviction because it would have made this case so much easier. Well, yeah, but that's not really fair. Just because someone did something five years ago, ten years ago, did something concurrent to this, doesn't necessarily mean that they committed this instance as charged in this case. Yeah, and, and in fact, and in the investigative stage, even though you are allowed to look at things like that as a prosecutor or as an officer when you're investigating a crime, there have been many investigations derailed, Alan Car Aaron Carroll, because the prosecution or the cops felt at the time that this guy must have done this because he's done these previous other things only to find out that they were wrong in that assessment. So when you're in the court of law, your, your point is well taken as, as it relates to hearsay. So let's go now to this evidence rule 404. It's probably the most complex evidence rule that's in the books. And that basically is the one, in my opinion, is the most powerful tool for the prosecutor and the defense. You have to know this rule inside and out. And it gets to your point, Aaron, that you said before, a moment ago, that other act evidence or bad acts in your life, either before or after, should not be introduced against the person to kind of just do like a pound on the guy because they're a bad person, a person of bad character. But like hearsay, there are a pile of exceptions to it. One of the most relevant ones that the Supreme Court has said is the most best exception for a prosecutor to introduce other act evidence is for motive. So say, for example, in, a, in many cases that I've had where the motive is about a bad act, let's say somebody knew that you did something that you weren't supposed to have done, and then they decided, I'm going to kill that person because they're in possession of that information, that would very well probably be, if it have, you have substantial evidence enough, it would be something where a court would say, I'm going to let that bad act evidence in because it explains the reason why the actual murder took place. But there's other ones other than murder, and you were talking off a set about common scheme and plan. And so if you could just explain to the folks here what common scheme and plan is, and then we're going to get to this trial and how you think it may have related to some of this videotape evidence. Well, look, I mean, I'll, I'll put the facts in here a little bit first to give it some context. There's apparently a recording of this defendant, Sean Gray, in the act of, as we understand it, raping the surviving victim. And a lot of people are saying, gee, why didn't that come into evidence? Why didn't the jury see it? Well, remember, this defendant pled guilty to more than half of the charges he faces. By pleading guilty, it looks like the rationale for that was to prevent that recording from coming into this trial so that it couldn't be used against them as to the kidnapping uh, and the death of the two uh, non-surviving victims that have been found thus far, at least, okay, because he's got a kidnapping as to Elizabeth Griffith, a kidnapping as to Stacey Stanley. Well, they're not the ones apparently portrayed in this recording. One way that it might have been able to sort of sneak into this case is if the prosecutor had gone and said, well, because he did it to the surviving victim in this video, it makes it more likely that he did it to these other victims. Right. And that might have been a way into the door, but and this is something that I notice sitting around this table frequently is different states interpret this rule very differently. 
some states will turn around and say, wait a minute, that's too much of a stretch to say that because he he's admitted to doing it to one person that that's also what he did to these other people in other states they wouldn't they would make that distinction and in others in, in some states they would make that distinction and in other states they wouldn't right I, listen uh, we're gonna go to the defense clips pretty shortly but I just want to just piggyback just one last thing off that comment um, I really want to know the answer to this whether the prosecution made a tactical decision or the judge said we're not allowing it because I think the prosecution could have made a clear argument just yes. like you did right there that this goes to show that if he did it here and he videotaped that he did it to the other ones as well that is kidnapping and it should be admitted to show that but if the prosecution made that tactical decision not to do it given that this is a death penalty which will be highly scrutinized I give the prosecutor even greater props for being a really skilled and crafted attorney Aaron so we are going to turn back now to some of the defense arguments here and see what you folks think please keep the questions coming in we're going to take a look at them right now and see if we can answer them and let's go to the court and see the defense closing in this case so at the Law and Crime Network, I'm here with Aaron Keller, and we just listened to the defense's closing arguments in this great trial. Um, I found it to be tactical, Aaron. I, I, I think he got up there. He said the words that he needed to say without compromising his credibility altogether too much because we all know in death penalty litigation that from the defense's point of view, especially in a really heinous and cruel uh, kind of murderer that's alleged here, it's all about keeping them alive another hour, like I say, another day, another minute. Um, and the defense lawyers have a playbook they go by um, which they're on the cutting edge of the Supreme Court decisions, U.S. Supreme Court decisions and decisions throughout the entire country. When I've tried death penalty cases as a prosecutor, typically speaking, I think the prosecution always had the upper hand in most trials we tried, except for death penalty litigation, because these crew of death penalty defense attorneys really know the nuances and what it, they read literally sometimes word from word because they know maybe what's going on in Indiana or California or Texas. Um, what are your thoughts about the closing? Look, uh, I agree with you. I think that it was tactical. Uh, and ultimately, the decision here is not necessarily about the guilt phase. It's about the punishment phase because the evidence is so overwhelming. So the attorney knows he doesn't really have any friends on that jury right now. So he, he said what he had to say, but he knows it's probably going to result in a guilty verdict. And hopefully there is when we'll see stronger advocacy out of the defense. Yeah, and, um, you know, when he also did the... the Real cute thing. I don't know if the prosecutor was about to jump up or not, but it was in the case, so in the guilt phase, I guess it was okay to say, but he's basically setting up the mitigating factors in the case, if you ask me, which is great. If you can get away with it as a defense attorney in the guilt phase, you do it, which is, hey, he confessed to this, okay? He's doing the right thing here. He's admitting, you know, essentially, uh, is remorseful, is admitting what he did and what he's responsible for. Um, and, and sometimes this can be a very compelling thing to jurors in the sentencing phase of a death penalty litigation when you combine it with other evidence when they're making a decision should I execute or not uh, although I would say that that would probably work in some death penalty cases this one may be a bridge too far for the defense given the gravity of these crimes yeah we'll have to see uh, I think that again the state has a really strong case here too often we sit around the table and we look at these cases and we say gee I wish we had an eyewitness I wish we had better DNA I wish we had gunshot residue I wish we had something here you've got a surviving victim on the witness stand yeah. you have recordings you have confessions you have dead bodies in the house sealed up you have examinations of DNA you have examinations of fly larva you have first-hand testimony from officers who found the bodies what more does the jury need? I don't think there are many facts left uncovered for the jury to make a decision here. Well, I'm going to give you some prosecutor psychology here. This is what happens when you have a case like that. You have everything that you could possibly wish for. You have the wish list. And, and in the back of your head, uh, I, I guess it's just human nature. It's called forebodedness. You sit there and you say, I don't know, I may have so much that the jury may start challenging that evidence because they want to make it like they're giving a fair shot to the defense. Because you worry about everything in trial and you always find a reason to be fearful the jury won't come back your way. But you're right, it's a strong case. I guess you could be paranoid. <laughs> but look, uh, you never know. Um, here, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be a, a pretty 
pretty surefire verdict. I'll be shocked if it's, if it's something other than guilty across the board. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, listen, folks, uh, again, I'm looking forward to some questions. Let's spark them up out there in question land. And we're going to go back to the Gaul case because there's some developments in the court there. And on the other end of that, we'll come back and uh, we'll discuss Gaul, great, and all this great uh, murder mysteries and all sorts of great cases that we hear, have here on the Law and Crime Network. You did not... Hi, Bob Bianchi here for the Law and Crime Network with Aaron Keller, and we were just looking right now at the Riley Gall uh, trial. Uh, this is the trial in which an 18-year-old at the time was accused of shooting two rounds into his ex-girlfriend's bedroom, one round striking her in the head and killing her. And Aaron, essentially this case is coming down to, uh, the defense already spelled it right out in the opening, I think as they should, um, was this just a, a reckless act versus whether or not, in, in the big numbers, would be purposeful, intentional. But um, there's also a felony murder charge here. So I want you to talk a little bit about your thoughts, given that you are the legal scholar of this uh, round table that we have here, of why that felony murder charge is so powerful for the prosecution. Yeah, in a lot of states, you have to... Well, let me back up. You have, in a lot of states, you have statutes that lay out first degree, second degree, and you have all these different types of murder. In other states, there's pretty much one murder statute, and then anything else that is a felony which results in a death becomes a felony murder. So in some states, there are many different flavors of a murder charge, including a limited felony murder. In other states, there's like a big premeditated murder charge, and then everything else is felony murder. What you have here is ultimately a characterization game that's going on or a characterization situation going on in that courtroom that we were just looking into. You've got the prosecution saying, look, he intentionally killed the girlfriend. The defense is saying, no, 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 he had done all these bizarre things to try to get her attention because the relationship had turned physical. And then she started to distance him, and he was doing all these bizarre things to try to scare her, hoping that he could then ride in and be the knight in shining armor. I go back to the trajectory. If he was trying to scare her, why did he fire the bullet into the house where the bullet actually went? If you're trying to scare somebody, okay, you're being reckless, you get charged with something, but why would you fire it right into the wall where her bed was located. Right. That, that just, I mean, the defense's theory doesn't quite make a lot of sense to me in that case, but um, th that's just my opinion. You know, yeah, when, and just, just quickly before, um, you know, I look at it as felony murder is the safety net for the prosecution in the case, because assuming that they can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt to all the jurors that it was his actual intention or premeditation to kill her, uh, you have to have a predicate offense under felony murder rule. And in this one, it's interesting because they're using the uh, child abuse or ch mm -hmm. child welfare statute as the health, safety, and welfare. And certainly because he's 18 and she's uh, 16. 16 at the Anybody time. under 18 qualifies under that statute as, as a child. child. Yes. Right. So firing that round or those rounds, even if it wasn't even his intention, um, would set up the predicate offense that is child endangerment. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody died during the course of the commission of that felony, which is the felony murder rule. That's the safety net. But trust me when I tell you, prosecutors want to pop the champagne and have drinks on winning a purposeful and intentional premeditated murder. Although in the end, they'll take the felony murder conviction. It's going to get him the same place. So yes. Right. So um, listen, this, I think this trial is fascinating that's coming up and, and we're eventually going to have some live uh, testimony here is Florida versus Raja. And um, I just want to do a little bit of a breakdown with the audience about what this case is about. Just so it's clear, the defendant in this case is a police officer. And this police officer was on a special detail for car burglaries that were occurring in a certain area in Florida. I think we have a picture of him up there right now. He had been on the force, I believe, about seven plus years, seven years. Um, and there was uh, the victim in this case that we now see uh, on the screen. He, his car had broken down, Aaron. He was a musician playing in a reggae band, and he was actually making phone calls trying to get assistance when this officer, who contrary to the instructions he was given pursuant to what we know in this police report, very detailed, very good police report, uh, was not wearing a safety vest, was not wearing a badge, was not wearing a law enforcement hat, was in an unmarked vehicle. And so while this victim is now looking for help because his car is broken yeah, down, look, you, this you officer this, comes upon him. You got this musician broken down by the side of the road at, at I think it was 3.14 in the morning. So a quarter after three in the morning, it's dark, his car breaks down, He's looking for help. He's on the phone with 911, and this guy pulls up behind him, the defendant here, Newman Raja. The defendant pulls up, unmarked car, plain clothes, 
He's got his own personal weapon on him, mm -hmm. not his service revolver. He pulls up behind the victim. They talk very briefly, bam, 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 gunshots. Later, the defendant, Newman Raja, the police officer, says, oh, I identified myself as a police officer, and he turned around, and, and, and I thought he was going to shoot me, so I had to shoot him first. Well, whoops, guess what? The police officer, the defendant, doesn't realize that the victim is on the phone with 911 and that there's a recording of it. He didn't identify himself as a police officer. He flat out lied about it. Right. Okay, now where we're at is in this stand your ground hearing because he's 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 trying to use the stand your ground law in Florida to to use himself uh, to, to try to say that he had reason to defend himself. Yeah, before we get to stand your ground, real quick, I want to go through the exchange. It was actually caught, as you've indicated, on the phone. And this is the victim saying, huh? And the officer defended saying, you good? Him saying, I'm good. And the cop saying, really? Him saying, yeah, I'm good. The cop saying, really? And the victim saying, yeah. And then the defendant police officer, get your effing hands up, get your effing hands up. The victim saying, hold on, get your hands up, with the expletive, drop. And then also, uh, they hear gunshots fired, and then there's a second volley of gunfire that's occurring about uh, 40 or so odd seconds later, and the gun that the uh, victim lawfully had in his possession is found back where the first round of shots were fired and as you indicated Aaron when he's on with the 911 operator the police officer calling it in he's making it appear the prosecution's argument is that the guy actually had the gun pointed at him at that point in time and he fired the shots it's a pretty compelling case and we're going to go to the courtroom because I believe that we have a preliminary hearing on the issue that you were just talking about as to whether or not they're going to be able to argue the stand your ground defense and on the other side of this clip we're going to talk a little bit about what stand your ground actually means versus a police officer allowed to use uh, justifiable force as a police officer. It looks like they're... Yeah, this is interesting, Aaron. They got a little sidebar, so let's talk a little bit about that law. An officer is allowed to use force, usually force greater than what an average citizen can. But in this particular case, what this hearing is about is whether or not they're going to be able to use, remember George Zimmerman, the stand your ground defense that any ordinary citizen um, can avail themselves to. My question to you is, can you explain what the stand your ground defense is and why this hearing is so important? Well, look, it basically eliminates a certain duty to retreat that if you are in a place where you have a legal right to be and someone uses deadly force against you, you can meet deadly force with deadly force if you have a legal uh, ground to be in that area. And, and usually it's pretty limited. Uh, here, I don't see it sticking because in, in most states, and it's been a, a, a couple months, a couple more than a couple of months since I've looked at Florida's, but a lot of times you've got to be in your home, on your, you know, literally in your home or in your car. Well, here, the defendant got out of his car, so I think that's a bit of a stretch to the law. When you get out of your car, you're, you're not in the, the so-called sanctity of your car. You know, and, and part of the reason we're here is this. There was a decision made in Florida that police officers can use the stand your ground law in their own situations if they use deadly force. And it, it basically could get them out of having to press the whole issue of whether they were justified in pulling the trigger as a law enforcement officer. The court said, hey, look, this statute covers everyone, therefore law enforcement officers can also invoke it. And that's what's going on in this hearing right here. You've got a reconstructionist on the stand, Michael Knox. He wrote a book in 2012 about the George Zimmerman case, which, of course, is the famous Stand Your Ground case. My whole fear with these stand your ground laws is that they they sound like they're a lot more protective than they really are. You know, I, st I, stand your ground kind of kind of sounds like you can walk around with an arsenal and and you know stand your ground. What it means is that if someone brings a threat to you, you don't have to try to retreat. run away. Right. I want to just go back to before we get to this this expert and the Zimmerman book. I want to go back to this idea about why when a police officer is allowed to use lethal force in their capacity. Let, let's look at the facts here. Raja claims that the gun was pointed at him, and in under any circumstances, a law enforcement officer confronting the possibility of serious. But the, the victim, death, I know. He, it, look, the victim didn't have a gun though. So he, what's he seeing things? I mean, is this guy walking around looking for? Well, at the beginning, he had a weapon, and and and, and then a, that weapon was that is true was found at the primary scene, and then later uh, in the secondary scene where the other three rounds were fired, the weapon was probably about forty or fifty yards away. But let's just assume that his self-defense claims that I'm. 
I'm a cop, I'm on the job, I identified myself as a police officer, I know that's not on the tape, but this is what they're arguing. He pulled a weapon out, I was in fear for my life, um, or I saw a weapon, and I shot him. I believe the Sandy Ground, I'm just curious down the road when you do the great legal research that you do, that the reason that they may be also arguing stand your ground for the officer is because that shifts the burden of proof at that point in time. Once you argue self-defense, the prosecution, usually in most states, has to disprove that now beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and I'm wondering whether or not there's something there where they want to take advantage of, hey, he's a cop and he's allowed to use deadly force greater than the ordinary citizen would be able to, but even if that wasn't appropriate, stand your ground, now the prosecution has to disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And I'm just spitballing here, Aaron, because we're at the very beginning of this case. Otherwise, I'm trying to figure out why it would be the defense would want to argue this. I think the defense is trying to argue its way out of a situation that doesn't look very good. When the, right. when the, when the, when the defendant is saying, oh, I identified myself as a cop, and then the, the victim fired first, and then the recording proves that that's not the way it went down, that's, that's kind of an issue. So why believe yeah. him about where the gun was pointed if he, if he can't even remember the, the facts of whether he identified himself as a cop? Okay. Hey, Aaron, great analysis. Listen, folks, I'm going to be signing off. It's always a pleasure to be here on the Law and Crime Network, especially with uh, the talent a guy like Aaron here, a great legal scholar. And uh, thank you very much for your um, questions and, and the kind compliments you've made online. And we're going to go back to the hearing now to listen to the Stand Your Ground defense expert for the defense.